Hey guys, Parker here. I got my good friend Matt Gates. He's an IPM specialist and why don't you tell us where the audience can find you? Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, you can find me for professional inquiries at zenthanol.com and I look forward to talking more. Thanks a lot for having me again. Thank you. Yeah, we did an episode where you were walking with us in the greenhouse talking about some of the strategies that I have going on and uh, things like companion planting, trap plants, and kind of a, a strategy for this upcoming season. Yeah, it was uh, it was interesting because you had brought a lot of plants that people talk about very often when it comes to things like companion planting. And I think there's a lot of nuance when it comes to this sort of a thing. So it was exciting for me to come on and sort of talk about some of that nuance, the beneficial insect attraction and the fact that you still have to look at those plants. You know, they're not, um, you know, they're not perfect. They can get their own pests sometimes. But if you do it strategically, you can get some advantages for sure. Yeah, it's not it's not quite so cut and dry. You can't yeah. just assume this is going to solve all your problems. It's a dynamic situation. Exactly, yeah. And that's really important to bring to light, so I'm always going to be appreciative of the opportunity. Yeah, we had um, I had a, some wildflowers down there. I have some known plants that will help deter some insects like, um, what do we have, mint, lavender, and uh, rosemary. And I'm going to grow those out and, and kind of proliferate those. But I also had a bunch of wildflowers that will bring pollinators. And I had a few pumpkin vines. And those things, since we did that video, I actually took out of there. Because, you know, if you were looking for something that was a trap plant <laughs> that was covered in aphids. And, and you know, it brought all those uh, parasitic wasps. Oh, yeah, exactly. So if you, have, um, if you have a plant that gets aphids and they don't go after your crop plant, and that can be a great alternative food source for some parasitoid wasps, at least. Yeah, well, I'd never seen aphids quite that big. <laughs> and so, I, you know, with me getting ready to put plants out there, I figured it was time to cull that thing. And, you know, it's nice having it in those smart pots where I can move them around the garden or, you know, take them out uh, at will. And, and, you know, if you have a trap plant, it can be a kind of a double-edged sword, right? You can have... Uh, you know, if, if bugs like that, they can get in there and attack that plant first, but it can also be a source of a, a vector for other um, insects to get into your garden. Very true. And then on top of that, oh, I remember we talked about how we were combining the effect of having a greenhouse with that mesh screen to, t to keep out some of those moths and other batty insects. Mm. But the fact that you can move the plants is kind of nice because if you need a source for some aphid parasitoids maybe you move it in if you know that they're not gonna touch your plants or you can move it out um, and then treat it if there's some sort of problem and then you can move it back in if it has some other benefit that you're trying to use so it is sure. nice to have that modularity yeah you know I mean I've been looking at using beds and there's a lot of I mean, there's benefits and drawbacks to a lot of different methods and the beds are nice for uh, uniformity for kind of making the space more efficient I would say but you lose that you lose a bit of dynamic ability you can't move those plants out you either let them stay or cut them out so having them in these smaller pots like let's say with the mint or lavender once those get larger I can move those out of the greenhouse and kind of create a barrier yeah, right. That's a really good point. You have that sort of integrative niceness that you have with like a banker strip. And in a lot of commercial agricultural grows, uh, people like to make banker strips if they're going to like have like a polyculture um, situation. So it's still kind of a monoculture in the way that it's like a lot of the same plants moving in one line, like east, west or north, south or whatever. Okay. But then you intersperse that with your crop plants. So it's a great way to have these like re reservoirs, mm. and and um, so they're there mixed in. But um, you have like every other row would be something that would either attract bugs that are you don't want on your uh, prized plants. Right? Yeah, or like um, or like if you want some of those parasitoids or some of those wasps or something, you can have this nice long or like beetles, for example. Some places like to have banker plants around the perimeter because there's some predatory beetles you might be able to try all kinds of other cool stuff but um, the benefit of having them concentrated or having those large ro rows is that they're able to kind of establish 
en masse, but you still get the benefit of having them interspersed with the crops so that it's not all just one exact, like you're not just having, you know, 10 rows of the crop, right? Mm. So there's different ways and different places where it makes more sense to do one thing over the other for sure. But on the microcosm of your greenhouse, you know, you can, you can make benefit of it too. Yeah. And I know we talked about ladybugs for instance, and you know, I, I'll see them around here. So having plants that will attract, I mean, you have to have the, the food source, right? So you need aphids and things like that before the ladybugs will be attracted. And a lot of people will buy ladybugs and release them in their grow preemptively, you know, to uh, potentially eat any pests that would affect their crop. But if they're not present or present in enough levels to keep those things in the area, you're, I mean, the ladybugs are going to leave, they're going to die off. And you had said something about a, the, speci- the species that's normally available is actually non-native and uh, can interfere with some of the local wildlife, right? Yeah, the Harmonia axiridis is the harlequin lady beetle. And it's um, it's got all kinds of different color morphs, so it can look like a a red lady beetle with some black spots, like we typically think of in North America, or it can be all kinds of other car- uh, colors, black with red spots, and all kinds of other ones like that. The problem is that, like you say, it's from East Asia. Mm. It eats native lady beetles. It can rarely, but it can transmit some pathogens to them and it can outcompete. And also they've been known to bite people, <laughs> not like super painfully. Um, or And also they exude this like really strong aroma that's nasty. <laughs> okay. And um, so there's all these like, uh, you know, detriments to, to using them. And, but people who buy them, like they don't necessarily know that. Uh, so it's helpful to bring that information to light. So people are using lady beetles. And also, you know, retail stores might not know this either, or they might be ambivalent. But a lot of times I find that people just don't know. So, and there are even natural ones that can be destructively harvested. So you got to be careful. If you care about those sorts of things, then I definitely recommend that you take a look and find out how they're being produced. And like you say, you know, don't apply them. Know that what they're going to eat is the aphids. Almost always, you know, lady beetles have known there are some species that eat other things. There's like a spider mite lady beetle. But you can't expect like an aphid feeder to eat your spider mites. So again, it's, it's kind of on you to like know what your tools are available, what those biocontrols are, what they do, and the limitations and strengths of them. Well, I imagine releasing that in an indoor setup can, you know, almost be cruel in a manner, right? A little bit. I mean, if if you have that many ladybugs and they've eaten everything or you don't have enough, you know, an aphid infestation, they're just going to die off in short order. Yeah, it's true. Especially, like you said, preemptively, like it's um, it's it's true. People will preventively release biocontrols. But yeah, you want to have a little bit of aphids there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I've I've seen it's springtime, right? So there's a lot of bugs, everything's blooming, we got uh, flowers, and my fruit trees are going strong. So I do see ladybugs around the area, and uh, like some of the other things that I'm, you know, that have stayed in the greenhouse for a while, like the spider species, and those had, um, I think, three or four egg casings. So I'm hoping to see those kind of reestablish in the greenhouse for this upcoming season. Yeah, that'll be exciting to see. I, I, we had a very fun time feeding <laughs> that uh, large silver uh, agriope spider, mm. or argiope. I always get the name wrong, but um, they're one of my favorites. Those, uh, they're very pretty. And uh, yeah, you had several um, egg sacs to uh to to see so that female was very reproductive so i I hope to see her yeah exactly and you helped (laughs) she's missing a leg but yeah she uh i had a fair amount of big healthy green hop uh uh, grasshoppers that i ripped the leg off and threw them in her in her web there so she's still going strong but i i imagine that she's gonna die off soon eventually although i have to admit because because we've known that spider for more than like a season like more than a year almost yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, it's probably the end of its life cycle, but you know, what a rich life for a spider like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had, I still have a couple little spots to patch up on the greenhouse, but last time, uh, Nate and I were down there filming, we, I had left the door open and I had had, I think 
about three little sparrows kind of bouncing oh around the greenhouse. We had to take a maybe about 20 minutes and try to shoo them out of there. So, you know, where there's there's plants, there's life, there's bugs, there's a little life cycle going. So uh, that's that's the plan for this season is to have a more dynamic growing space, have um, a diversity of plants and you know, with with the variety of things that I'm growing down there, other than cannabis, I'm I've seen things that work well. You know that I've I've seen uh, bees and little uh, pollinators come around, and I've seen like those the pumpkin plant. There, it's very vigorous at first, but started to get. It seems to be very susceptible to powdery mildew. Oh yeah, uh, aphids like I've never seen before, and I decided to just pull that thing out of there. So. Uh, I'm I'm planning on putting in some, uh, maybe some perennial plants as well that are going to, uh, you know, not just uh, bloom in the summer. They'll be around for a bit. Uh, one of the other things I think it's it is an annual, but the marigolds are mm. supposed to keep those cabbage worms away, and that's something that I've seen a a, a bit of information on, and I want to try growing that next to my cannabis plants. Because those damn caterpillars, man, those things, it's a heartbreak. And, uh, you know, those, they do so much damage. And, you know, it, it's always in the, the best looking nug. I had just a, a season long battle with those things last year. Yeah. And like, uh, since you mentioned it, like those cabbage butterflies, the caterpillars, those like inchworms, they tend to eat um, like the foliage, but then you can sometimes get those budworms and it can be a real big hassle when of course they get after the flower and and do that kind of damage but you get both at the same time you know you're kind of being hit in the foliage and in the flower when it when it does come up so but with yeah. that mesh screen hopefully you'll um you'll not have that problem yeah they seem to always sneak in and this last year i had a few plants outside and those i, I mean you can see what the physical barrier does with the plants inside i, I still was getting some of that but the ones outside were just ravaged. They, oh, wow. uh, and you see them come en masse when everything starts budding and they exude all those oils. And, and uh, oh, it's a heartbreak. And s some of those plants I was excited to see grow, but the caterpillars just did a number on it. So uh, it gets to a point where, I'm like, should I just cut this plant down? But then that plant turns into its own little trap plant. It's like, all right, well, at least they're at least somebody's enjoying this plant we'll let the caterpillars have it i'll let this thing i'll set it off to the side way in the corner of the garden and hopefully that will attract these butterflies and keep it off of my my main harvest well and like in a way if you're able to get the mesh to be really um sealed hmm. uh, which seems to be pretty easy or at least pretty possible of course things can sometimes sneak in it's a greenhouse but you know you patch up those parts and like you said you already saw a difference um, you know the only way you get those parasitoids of caterpillars is those caterpillars being there you know right. the only and and there's microbes there out there you know I'm being a little bit uh, you know it's I'm speaking very generalistically but you get all kinds of things that will parasitize or otherwise harm those caterpillars so if you establish them away you know, it's it's more likely that you're going to have those good guys come in and be attracted. And maybe they'll get in, zip in there uh, with the ones that sneak through. So you kind of get, create this bio barrier. But like you say, it's dynamic. And um, there's something to be said of like the cost benefit analysis, right? And um, even from season to season, you know, we, we may go through years that are hotter than others. I know this year we've yeah. had a ton of rainfall. So, oh, yeah. Um, I'm expecting to see a, a really heavy season with a lot of these so-called pests that may interact with our garden. So I'm, I'm trying to prepare, have a plan of action for multiple scenarios and, you know, hit them on a few different fronts. It's really good because like, you, you know, you touch upon something that's so critical and I recommend people all the time when I'm talking to clients or even just friends, it's like, have a record if you can, you know, a little journal if you want, or online, you know, you can create a little Excel spreadsheet or something. Just, it doesn't have to be super detailed, but the more details, the better in my opinion. But you can just, yeah, like you say, you can look season to season and you can track like, oh, you know, you'll see a pattern. Oh, we, we tend to get spider mites at like week 14 or week 21 or whatever. And 
then you can sort of predict that and then you can make uh, treatment decisions that are preventative based on that information. Of course, that requires you growing multiple seasons in the same place and also paying attention to like the weather and all that information, but you make a great point. Lots of rainfall, things are greener, which means you're going to have a lot more bugs. And also you live in Southern California, so we kind of already had that problem. We don't really get frost in a lot of places, so it's just going to be more emphasized than normal. So it makes sense to uh, to to think about the ramifications. Yeah, because there's certain <clears throat> types or there's certain areas in the country where, let's say, something like spider mites, they they have a tolerance for, let's say, the top end of of whatever temperature that they can yeah. handle. So. If you're growing someplace like Arizona you, in a greenhouse, you may have spikes in heat in the day yeah. that may kill off those pests. When, uh, you know, in Southern California, it seems to be the sweet spot where everything does just fine. <laughs> it's why so. people like to grow here, right? So it's like a blessing and a curse. Like, for example, I don't mind it when it's not super sunny. I kind of like it overcast, mm-hmm. but um, obviously that's not great for all the people who are like counting on it to be sunny, <laughs> sunny San Diego or whatever, right? Yeah, you can always tell somebody that's not from San Diego when they get uh, p- yeah. pissy with a, a, a cloudy day. Yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for these days. I don't do well with the heat or the cold, and um, even up in the golden era, the, the uh, Emerald Triangle, right? So you have. Oh sure. Um, a lot of the growing areas there, they're uh, uh, at a certain elevation where they have. It, it's not as conducive to those types of pests that I have to deal with. It's not as conducive for things like botrytis and powdery mildew. So everybody's got their own list of things and hurdles to to uh, jump over to get to a successful harvest. That's a good point. Like I've worked several times in the Emerald Triangle area, mostly in Humboldt. And, right, like anyone who's been there will know, especially if you, you know, fly in or you drive in through San Francisco, you can see that it gets foggy, it gets misty, it's mountainous, so it's going to have, you know, it's scraggy. Here, um, more southern, you know, mid, you know, middle California, southern California, there is the chaparral. So on the one hand, you can get bugs at nighttime all the time in like the desert. If you're the only light source for like miles, then people, then bugs are gonna be attracted to that. But at the same time, you know, um, a lot of those, a lot of those agricultural pests, they might not be able to establish on like the scrag, the like, the um, the like adapted to desert plants that are like woody and like they don't have a lot of like big luscious leaves, you know. Sure. So they're not gonna do as well. But of course, it depends on the pest. Yeah, well, I, I helped a buddy set up a grow out in Lancaster, and there's much of nothing out there. So, <laughs> you know, what they have to deal with is way different than what I have to deal with. And we went recently to a, a Canacon in Oklahoma, and we got a lot of people talking about the, the grasshoppers there. The, oh, yeah. The, those were a huge problem for them. And I imagine uh, that would make it really tough for an actual outdoor grow. You would need... Uh, a, a greenhouse that's buttoned up really tight <laughs> to keep yeah. those suckers out. Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, I mean, they start smaller, but they're kind of they're kind of big enough that you could get those mesh screens. But you're right, like you have to make sure that there's no holes, and if they're swarming or whatever, um, then yeah, it can be a real catastrophe. I had so I actually had somebody talking to me about them here in uh, a little bit north of us. Um, just where it's getting a little bit more kind of like Oklahoma, you know, a little flat, a little deserty, but, um, yeah, it can be a real, real problem. And that's why it's like, it's just not tenable in some place. Like, that's the thing people want to grow and I'm never going to tell somebody, oh, you can't grow necessarily. But like, if your situation is such that you have certain resources, certain things you can do or can't do, it might not be tenable to grow in the way that you might want to. Yeah, because, I mean, you watch videos, you hear people talk about growing, and growing can be easy. It can. But you have to take into account your environment, uh, all these specific things to your area. Now, if somebody is dealing with uh, grasshoppers out there, have you ever had any, have you ever used things like ducks or chickens? I know chickens can, will probably eat most of your plant, probably more (laughs) your plant than the locusts A little bit of both. Yeah. 
but I know ducks are great for that. You know, like uh, they use it for snail control in gardens and things. That's what I was going to mention. Yeah, like, and that's a very um, popular quote, right? Like, oh, you don't have a snail problem. You have a lack of duck problem, <laughs> you know, and um, although I'm not sure it's always um, applicable, certainly, like, um, it's nice like that's one of the things that's kind of one of the capital R romantic things about like growing in like humble area or something like that where they've got there's people um like living in the place where they grow and they've got maybe some farm animals or they may have some small like a chicken or two or maybe some ducks or they might have a pet um or they even have um like for example I worked with um with moon made farms up there and uh you know, they, they lived where they worked and they also had, um, you know, they're like frogs in the shower, you know, there's all kinds of animals <laughs> out there. And, um, I don't know, it just, you're very connected. You're very in tune with the, uh, with the local environment. That's really helpful. It's really it's like helpful. A, a homestead that happens to grow a few cannabis plants. <laughs> yeah. They were growing vegetables. Like, you know, yeah, it would, it would be the case where, and I was up there for, um, several days one time and like, yeah, like we would work you know we'd have some workers learning and then um you know at the end of the day we'd have some of the vegetables that they freshly grew at the location and of course one of the questions we talked about was like how much of these are a threat to our our crop and there was some crossover some thrips on both crops you know some aphids you know things like that so you do have to consider that but um but generally speaking it was it was going really well yeah well i know most people, let's say you're in a city uh, apartment, let's say you're growing in New York in a grow sure. tent, you're not going to be able to use some of these measures. But right. as far as biocontrols that that would be applicable in an area like that, I've been hearing some about, I haven't used them myself, but some of those like nematodes and uh, other kind of microscopic predatory species that you can inoculate soil with. Yeah, so... Um... I'm a huge fan if you've got like fungus snap problems, like the professional agricultural biocontrol people often like to use are like Steiner Nema felsiae or SF nematodes, um, Heterohabditis bacteriophora or HB nematodes are also really popular for like fungus gnats and shore flies and those, those flies that get in and they like colonize your soil or substrate. And they're really great because, um, you know, you get like millions. <laughs> you know, and uh, you apply them, you have to make sure the, that the uh, solution you put them into is agitated so that you're always getting like an even spread. What people will do is they'll like dissolve them in water or like whatever the packaging is, they won't agitate the water. So they all float down. And so you're getting no, you get, you're watering them in, right? And you're getting no nematode, no nematode, no nematode, all the nematodes at the very end when they pour out. So you got to be careful. But yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like activating a packet of yeast, right? You yeah. want to mix it up. and um, <clears throat> So if you're going to use that, you would need to keep kind of a living soil system throughout the season to keep those healthy and reproducing. Well, it's sort of like um, you're kind of like running them through and until they're like until there's like no fungus gnats and, and there's going to be some level of like you don't have to sometimes people reapply them especially in a commercial, you know, situation where even if like, like, you know, if we just let them keep reproducing and finding more larvae on their own after the first application, you know, maybe the, the solution is found at, you know, in two or three weeks. But if we reapply again, maybe we're done in one or two weeks or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. but, um, generally it's like they, the nematodes, they have to get into the, uh, host and it's usually something much larger than them like some sort of like again like a fly larva or a caterpillar or something sometimes they release a bacteria which is what kills them actually and then they reproduce in there and then there's a bunch of juveniles that come out and then the process oh. continues so it's like if you have a lot of fungus gnats then you know it makes sense but if you only have like one or two you know it's kind of a little bit overkill but it might be better than like waiting and seeing yeah, because once once you have a full blown infestation of anything, that is a, a battle you don't want to have. I mean, it's it's kind of finding a balance, right? Uh, so you don't want to 
spend all this money yes. getting having treatments for problems that you don't have yet, but you want to be prepared in a sense of so having a record of the problems that you face and anticipating what's coming up. How am I going to combat this? What worked last season? What am I going to do different? And also like just knowing the biology is super helpful. You know, I have a YouTube channel, Xenthanol, same as the Xenthanol website in which I do my professional work where I make that footage available, pictures and information because, you know, if somebody doesn't know how the biocontrol works, they might think that something to them is intuitive, but is actually not the case. And they might apply them, like I was saying about like how much fungus gnats are you actually dealing with. Also, let's say you apply the nematodes, well, how did the fungus gnats get there in the first place? And especially as you say, if it's like an indoor place or somebody's house or apartment or something like that, you know. Um, they're not like endemic to your floorboards unless they're really rotten maybe sure so like be um, be mindful like maybe they came in on a cutting for example yeah that's the that's the downside from I mean seeds are certainly nice in that respect because you can control what's coming into your space but those cuttings man I mean if I've even in years past where I've been growing I've had other friends that also grow who have been battling things like spider mites and they'll want to come check out my grow and I'm like you know <laughs> I you, you can look but you can't touch yeah he'll, he'll look through the door I'm like you know I, I don't <laughs> I don't want you in here I don't want to uh, lose my crop yeah and actually right now I'm, I have a grow tent in my shed and I got a couple of cuts from a friend so I've, I've been noticing that it looks like I have spider mites that came from that so Lucky me, I'm, I'm going to be spraying them down with some Azimax and there you go. see if I can get that under control. But, you know, that's the, uh, I mean, with, with cuts, so there's, aside from the parasites, there's a lot of pathogens that can you can introduce into your space that are a lot more prevalent in some of these um, uh, cloning facilities. You know, oh, sure. Kind of run rampant. Well, yeah, and if you've got, like, thousands of plants and not enough personnel to, like, be scouting and, and checking and... Yeah. You know, doing uh, like an, uh, for nurseries, you know, it's a big struggle. It's uh, not a enviable position to have to consider like dozens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of little cuttings and plants that you're making all the time. And it can be easy for something to just slip in and not just for cannabis, but other crops too. Uh, you know, I recently did a resumite video where I talked about my own experience with not just hemp resumite but also uh, rosebud mm. uh, mite, which is a russet mite, and it, it vectors a virus called, that causes rose rosette disease. And uh, a cut flowers company I was working with, they got all of their flowers, all their roses from Holland. And then, but what happened was that they brought them in here and they had to be quarantined and they had pe representatives like come in and, and we, had to like be very careful and so they would in inspect to see like oh is there rose rosette disease here you know because we would have to cull everything if that was the case so you know as cannabis also becomes more not just from a home grow but also from a commercial standpoint even if you're not growing commercially it's important to keep up on the news see what could be coming in that's new um, you know I just saw a first report recently for um, head blight in cannabis caused by fusarium, uh, I think fusarium graminearum, which is common in wheat, for example. Um, and then also there was like a yellows uh, vein virus. I'm forgetting the exact name now, but that was like first reported in cannabis recently. So all kinds of new and exciting things that may be a severe problem or maybe a mild problem. I don't want to be, um, you know, Sometimes a new pest comes in and it's not actually as bad as other pests, right? Well, you know, you'll see that in a lot of industries that develop. You know, there's a lot of people throwing their hat in the ring, a lot of big facilities opening up. So with that, you get the proliferation and the um, yeah. kind of evolution of different pathogens, different pests. And so things that maybe were never a problem with wild hemp or wild cannabis now that we're cultivating and monocropping you get these uh, pests that will become specialized and in infecting and uh, taking over these big crops yeah so true and also like um, humans have a big history of like concentrate of course when you concentrate the plants and then you concentrate the cultivation 
what can happen is you get this little sort of Darwin's Finches scenario where every every uh, greenhouse is like the a little Galapagos island yeah. where they can develop, you know, and sometimes you get funny little permutations. You got the big industrial uh, grow aphids. Or yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where you sprayed everything under the sun, and now they're like that happened with two spotted spider mites, which are super common in cannabis and elsewhere. So I heard when you're combating things like that, it's good to have. Uh, let's say we're talking about spider mites. It's good to have within your own IPM a few different products that you rotate, so you kind of keep the organism on their toes and you know they'll they'll develop resistances to these things over time and even something that was effective in killing it the previous season uh, may not be so good for you this season so having a, a few different things in rotation is uh, not a bad idea right absolutely and you know also using like biocontrols potentially i'm a huge fan of uh, persimilis mites phytocilius persimilis for Two spots spider mite in particular. They're a specialist. They co evolved with them and they do really good against uh, the spider mites. So you might like knock them down with, um, with one product and then hit them with the biocontrol. Very different, very different control methods. So, and also, it tends to be the case with a lot of insects and mites where they, if they develop a resistance to a really noxious compound or even like a uh, noxious to them, even if it's safe for us. Um, usually those mutations without getting super in the weeds, they usually confer a benefit against living in a world where you're going to get hit with this really noxious compound you'd never encounter in life, in, na in nature. But then it usually comes at a big physiological cost, like something about their neurology or their physiology, like a mutation changes. So maybe they're slower, less reproductive. Maybe yeah. they eat less or something. And uh, it washes out when that selection pressure goes away. Gotcha. Sometimes, a lot of times, not always. So but. we're we're driving these uh, these mutations with the way we're cultivating these. Yeah, no matter what we do, we will be a selection pressure. And I think that's an important thing to mention. Like, um, I'm not saying that uh, if you only use biocontrols or if you only use certain chemistries that are really uh, not very harsh for the environment, which you should do, it doesn't mean that, like, you'll have no problems. Like, there's still going to be influences that we do as, you know, humans who are growing. So with a question that I had with, let's say, those predatory mites that you like using, if you were going to be spraying a product that is, let's say, considered a miticide, hmm. what order, how would you use products like that in conjunction with biocontrols like a predatory mite? The most popular way to do it and the one that I often advocate for is kind of a one-two punch. You knock down spray and then you come in with a biocontrol application. So for example, you might, um, let's say you're in veg, you know, one of my favorite ways to deal with spider mites is hit them with wettable sulfur if you can. Okay. But if you have other biocontrols, so that's miocidal, it's also fungicidal, it's also insecticidal. So if you've already applied some predatory mites, you don't want to use the sulfur because you're going to kill them. Unless, like, the situation warrants it, you know, that's a cost-benefit analysis. Maybe they're just out of control and you want to, like, reset. You know, you don't have to cut all your plants down. You can just spray the sulfur or whatever other myocidal product it is. And then you maybe wait a few days or you time it so that maybe you have the biocontrols coming in in a week. Well, maybe you have two opportunities for like two different sprays. And then you should mark where you found the worst ones and, you know, come in after you've sprayed and see how much damage you did. And well, there needs then, to be a little rhythm to this. You exactly. Don't wanna, like, let's say you release ladybugs or something like that. You wouldn't want to release those and then spray it with something that uh, is going to harm those things. So. Exactly. Yeah. If you want to maximize, you know, um, of course, like I was saying, sometimes it might be the case where, you know, you're you applied the persimilis first, maybe, or maybe you're in a situation. I've been in situations where people. They just assume they're going to get spider mites <laughs> because it just happens every year. Yeah. So they're like, oh, it's springtime. Let's just start applying them, you know. Um, and that's totally valid for some people. Like, that just makes sense. But then, like, you might be like, well, it's too bad. So maybe in this particular section of the greenhouse, it's really bad. And elsewhere, it's not. So we're just going to hotspot treat. 
that's another way you could do that too. So you kind of spray in sections so you don't hurt everything that you've applied. And so you can buy, are those like in little packets, like kind of like those nematode types things? You would uh, order those and then release them or you just dump them on the plant or you mix them with water or something? Yeah, so like with predatory mites, um, a lot of them often come in a sort of a sachet or some sort of a packet. They can be either like a pure culture, like Persimilis up until recently didn't have this option for a lot of biocontrols, but the way that we rear them has become more sophisticated. So certain companies have invested in better technology. So you can just get straight Persimilis with no filler, no substrate. Might be a little bit more expensive. And you can like just hang them on a packet. Other ones like uh, Cucumeris, Swirskii, things like that, they're more generalists. You can um, get them with like, there's a feeder mite inside the packet and there's different life stages and essentially they feed, reproduce, and as the population inside gets larger, they're exploiting their behavior to like get out of the way if there's too many. So you would want to identify a viable food source for these mites on your plants before you go ahead and release them? Yeah, which should hopefully be the pest itself. Right. Like broad mites or russet mites or some other pests that they go after. White fly is a big one that, uh, but you know, a lot of these, it's important to know, like they'll go after certain life stages, but not others. So like a lot of times they'll go after like the eggs and the larval stage of whatever the pest is. Maybe like a white fly is a good example of that. Cucumerous mites will go after the eggs and the larvae, but they don't really go after the adults. Not really. Um, similarly, so uh, to stagger the release, maybe a little. Oh well, um, well, it's more like you got to understand that if you're not seeing the white flies die, it doesn't mean that the population is having a huge problem because all the eggs are getting destroyed. And when their short life cycle is over, there's nothing replacing them. So it can be a little bit. I guess what I'm saying it can be a little bit um, deceptive if you didn't know that. Because people are used to, they want that like contact kill. Exactly. I release it and then I see dead everything. And that's 100%. not how those biocontrols work. Or certainly not all the time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's uh, very insightful. And I'm, uh, you know, I don't know if I'll be releasing those predatory mites this season, but I do have a few products that we had talked about that we'll uh, be putting into play. So uh, thanks for hanging out and chatting, and I look forward to having you next time. I look forward to it. I'm glad that we talked about this, and I'm excited to see how you grow in the future. Thank you. Yeah, and if you want to see our video where we're walking and talking in the greenhouse and checking out some of these bugs, you can look at our YouTube channel. And that's a wrap for today's Grow Talk. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you found the conversation today informative and helpful. 